lived in. Well, he didn't really live in much of a house, did he? Ben? I'd like to go back a little bit uh, when you talked about training up a child and the way you go and when you depart, gets old and not depart from it. Uh, we have our youngest son and oldest son, and uh, they've gone the way of the world to some degree. But uh, we've been praying for them over the years, and uh, they're coming back. And so uh, I believe that uh, we we uh, are accountable as uh, parents to continue to uphold our our children unto God, that He will bless them to have the experiences in life that will bring them back. Uh, and uh, there was a time in my life when we were. Uh, over at uh, South Chrysler Church on Salisbury Road, and uh, I, the prophet over the the, pre, the uh, pastor over there prophesied that our my three sons would be uh, uh, servants of the Lord. And uh, I've always wondered about what that meant, but it means that their hearts have the desire, but their will is weak. And uh, I believe that we underestimate this gospel and this truth that the Lord has given us understanding of, that when we do train up our children in the way of the Lord, in his uh, mercy and grace, and uh, they've read the books and they understood, uh, when they have their lives come to a point where they need to be able to see the truths and the, and the, and the clear path that's there for them, uh, that, that they've gone on the crooked path, and that crooked path has brought them back to the straight path because it's the only path that will get them where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Dennis? So getting back to your previous comment about what Oakland related to and Christ and living in a previous age and Peter living in a previous age and some of the and those things don't relate to our age and and the, you know just go back to the Sermon on the Mount you know th those are principles that Christ taught that are ageless and 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 those things never you know they're pertinent in his day they were pertinent in Adam's day they were they are pertinent in our day and in the days that to come, and so th those are things you know he he lived he lived what he taught, and so hence to me he's an example because yeah. he lived what he taught. Yep. Appreciate that, yep. Coral. In the scripture that we've been studying the last few minutes uh, about training up a child, nowhere in that verse. Is talk, does it talk about church? It doesn't say if you train up your children to go to church, they will always attend church. Sometimes we as parents or grandparents feel guilty that, well, gosh, I, I think I did everything I could to get them to stay in church, and now they've drifted away. But it doesn't say anything about church. It's just training them up the way they should go. Okay, thank you. Darlene? But don't you think that when they're, you train them up, they have a moral compass, or we hope they have a moral compass, but the more that they stay away from the church, the more they kind of fall into the worldly ways of the world. They get to feeling, well, a drink here or there, that's not that big of a deal, or going to maybe places that are not uh, Christian environment type things. I think that we live in a society that we want God and Jesus Christ to conform to our way of thinking rather than for society turning into what God and Jesus Christ wants us to do. And uh, like I said Sunday, I have cousins and they're good people, but they, you know, God is not that important to them anymore. And uh, I love them dearly, and you invite them to church, nope, yeah. you know, we were made to go to church when we were young, and we're not going to have to be made to go now. 
Linda Evans over here. In 1964, that was our clue that if you brought a child up in prayer, that child would pray at school, give testimony, mm -hmm. give scripture at school. You take it away and look at the world now. Right. No yeah. prayer in a school. You can't even bow the knee at a football game. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, 1047, so I say we take a break and resume at 11 o'clock for part two. Not hereby justified, but he who judgeth me is the Lord. Uh, you don't hear the evangelicals talking about this one very much. It reminds me of section, I think it's 118, it plus or minus one or two, where it talks about the elders that have con come under condemnation for not uh, being valiant in testimony, and it says they could still be saved but the reward which is given for their works be withheld um, because they haven't done anything good. So, uh, yeah, you can be saved, but the reward is based on what you do, and we're to be uh, stewards. Here's another good one, Mosiah 2:49. But this much I can tell you, that if you do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe to keep the commandments of God and continue in the faith of what you have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even unto the end of your lives you must perish. And now, O man, remember and perish not. Now, F. Henry Edwards says that there's, there's more to righteousness than moral striving. And I'm going to say that our understanding of righteousness grows and matures over time. Um, he writes, Righteousness is related to ultimates about which human beings are not fully informed. And the Holy Spirit guides and empowers an understanding of this. And then he writes that God is complex. We might think uh, otherwise. No, he says he is holy and complex. And our understanding of him is imperfect and requires time and earnest worship and seeking understanding to understand him. So the psalmist wrote, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And he writes that this is most earnestly sensed in worship. And we have to believe that God is interested in our salvation. And he says that worship begins with praise and thanking God for knowing and addressing our needs. Now here's a, a, one quote from Mere Christianity from C.S. Lewis. I said I'd have a couple of quotes about him. Uh, this one I think is very true. It says, a moderately bad man knows he's not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. This is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you're awake and, w and not when you're sleeping. Now, Genesis 6 and 66 says that all things bear record of God. Now, I'll just tie this back into our theme. I must keep in touch with God. Well, this says that all things bear record of God. So everything around us in some form or another is witnessing of God. Um, I'll give you an example. To me, a maple leaf, I really love maple leaves, especially this time of year when they're red and orange. But the symmetry on them is so perfect. It's, you know, it's the, like the Canadian flag, right? So you all know what it looks like. Um, so to me, that, that tells me that God is a God of order. Um, <clears throat> we see the beauty of nature. We go, God must be an artist because nature is aesthetic. Um, we... Uh, in parenthood, parenting, we begin to understand how God looks at us as his children, even as we look at our children in love and concern and always trying to raise them in the way they ought to go. Well, that's how he looks at us. So those are just a few examples. I don't know if any of you can think of any more, but um, we, we certainly see that that is true. You know, one of the things that is a real puzzle 
I'll just throw it out there. This might be something Rod likes. I don't know. <laughs> but mathematics is uncanny in the way it can explain nature. You know, we have E equals MC squared, a very simple equation, but it relates energy to matter with a constant of the speed of light squared. I mean, that not that amazing? Um, and so if you've had many math classes, you kind of get into that and you, and you kind of wonder, well, is that because God followed laws or is that because God made the laws this way? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe Jack knows. Chicken and A, yeah. <clears throat> so we've already been mentioning uh, evolution a bit this morning. And um, I'll tell you this story. So I was in at the audiologist's office, well, actually, yesterday. And uh, he has a big chart up on the wall. And it has a picture, uh, here's an ear, and then the, it comes in the canal, and there's an eardrum, and the eardrum's connected to the hammer, and the hammer's connected to the anvil, the anvil's heck connected to the stirrup, if I remember my science right, and that's connected to the cochlea, which has the nerve cells in the cochlea, and from the cochlea there is a nerve that goes to the opposite side of the brain, and, be, and then, so you have two ears, and they both do that, and you go, oh yeah, sure, this could happen by evolution. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? And Terry and I were talking the other day, how about the eyeball? Can you imagine that just happening? Really? Mm, I don't think so. Well, the other thing I was going to tell you about C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, and again, he's called the apostle to the skeptics for a reason. He says, evolution is about as likely as if you take a bottle of milk and spill it on the floor and get a map of New York. That's always stuck with me. And like I say, I read that in, in high school, or in college. Terry, uh, the, the mic is not working. The battery went dead. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then you think about it, there's there's thousands of plants and animals and uh, it's a, quite an amazing thing. So we're we're talking about go ahead, Kevin. seems to be some similar, similar similarity. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about how everything witnesses of God. You know, the 23rd Psalm talks about how the Lord leads us beside still waters and, and makes us lie down in green pastures. And I believe that's true. I mean... We go on vacations all the time to wild places. The wilder, the better. We just got back from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and saw some very beautiful scenes up there. But um, you know, we talk about being temperate in all things, right? 
So there's Christians out there today that say, I can worship just as good in the boat fishing on the lake as I can being in church. Well, you know, I'm going to question that. Um, so I'm going to, well, I was going to jump down here, but I don't see it right off. I'll get, I'll get to it in a minute. So, you know, the commandment is to love God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength. Now, that's four different aspects. So, if you read the scriptures all day long, every day, you would be loving God, perhaps, with your mind. Oh, wait a minute. That's only one-fourth of the equation. Um, <clears throat> we have to be doing as well as thinking. We have to have our heart uh, centered, uh, our affection centered on God. Now, in Deuteronomy 6... And I don't think the scripture is actually written out. I'm going to, well, uh, maybe I'll just tell you what it says. You know, this is the one that says uh, that we're supposed to talk with our children at all times. Uh, when, we, when we're sat down, when we're walking, when we're lying down, and when we're rising up, we should be talking about the gospel all the time. And then it talks about have them attached as frontlets on your eyes and on your posts and um, says that the Jews wore tassels that were attached with blue threads and they had these one inch boxes with parchment on them that they put in the boxes and they had them on their forehead and under their arm. Uh, these were some of the things they did to keep God always in the center of their attention. Now, <clears throat> you know, we have the Ten Commandments which still apply. Now, Jesus elaborated on those. He took them to another level, if you will, but uh, he didn't ever contradict any of the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is, thou shalt have none other gods before me. Well, Dumbelow writes about that, uh, to forbid the worship of other gods, Israel would come to disbelieve in them. Now, here's a really interesting one for whether to worship out on your boat or worship in church. Again, this is from Dumelow, and he, he's writing about this commandment. And he says, the sure result of discontinuing the worship of God is the denial of his existence. Now, one of the things they were saying was, if they told Israel, don't worship, you know, don't be associated with these other gods, only the God of Israel, that they would come to disbelieve in these other gods. So, yes, it, it is important, I think, to be in church. Now, the fourth commandment, oh, Linda, yeah. Talk real loud. Mike.
Um, so a little Oakman nugget, I think maybe I had it for the last day, but it, it might apply now. Uh, he was saying that a priesthood member that quits to function in his priesthood will be held accountable for the sins that people commit who would not have committed those sins had he been present to minister to them. That is scary. Mike? So uh, the fourth commandment, jumping down to the fourth commandment, section 59, well, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Then going to 59, it says, and that thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world, thou shalt go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments upon my holy day, for verily this is a day unto thee to rest from thy labors and to pay thy devotions unto the Most High. So he says, go to the house of prayer. Now, I know there's some that feel like the house of prayer, you're talking about Kirtland Temple, and that's the, the only place, so that we shouldn't say, or like house of the Lord, sometimes I get up and I'll start the service, well, we welcome you to the house of the Lord, and some will go, well, that, that's Kirtland Temple, you shouldn't be saying that. Well, I don't know, you know, but to me, in this verse anyway, house of prayer means the sanctuary, wherever it is you're worshiping, and... Uh, now, I'm going to take a little side trip here a little bit. Um, in section 85, it talks about a house of learning and a house of order. And then in section 92, it talks about a lower house for your communion, your preaching, your fasting, and your praying, and an upper room for the school of mine apostles. That was section 92, and that's definitely talking about a temple. And in section 94, it says that the temple is for the salvation of Zion and a place for thanksgiving and instruction. Um, now, last time Kay and I went through uh, Kirtland Temple, um, the guide, who was COC, uh, who was a lady, well, we actually knew her from 39th Street Congregation, uh, she told us that you know how Kirtland has three levels, right? And I can't remember what they were. I don't know, maybe some of you know. But like the first level was supposed to be the house of prayer. And, oh, uh, I don't know where I put it. The second level, uh, I forget. And then, then the third level of uh, house of order. And then a house of, a house of learning and then house of order was the third one. Um, and anyway, she was saying that, you know, the first floor was this house of prayer and the second one, House of Order, or something like that, which I thought was very interesting because if you've been to Kirtland, you know that those two rooms are, I think, are very similar, aren't they? Are they not? Of course, the third floor is kind of divided into classrooms, but um, anyway, uh, the reason I mention that is because we are going to be thinking about, well, we are thinking about the uh, Holy Sanctuary and some of the things that will be happening there, so. I just mentioned these were some of the things relevant to the house of <clears throat> house of the Lord in both Kirtland and Independence. Of course, Independence was never built. And you know the dimensions of the house of the Lord in Kirtland and, and Independence were slightly different. Um, the one in Independence, you have to go to times and seasons to get the actual dimensions, but they're only a few feet different. Okay, so now here's a really interesting quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, and above all, you must be asking which door is the true one, not which pleases you best by its paint and paneling. The question should never be, do I like that kind of service? But are these doctrines true? Is holiness there? Does my conscience move me towards this? Is my reluctance to move to this door due to my pride or my mere taste or my personal dislike for this particular doorkeeper? Uh, I guess you all caught that. I think nowadays a lot of people decide which church to go to by is the pastor really charismatic? Um, 
boy, this is a really pretty church, and so forth, um, and not doctrine so much. Although, probably a lot of people are prejudiced against us because of our doctrine, because of our Book of Mormon, and because we are not preaching uh, once saved, always saved, and things like that. But uh, do you think in any way that the remnant church is too centered on doctrine? No, I'm seeing some heads shaking no. Um, we have a friend, I think she told Kay, who told me, they were in a Baptist church, and they said, you get more doctrine in five minutes in the remnant church than you do in a whole service in their church, so, because their kids went to a Baptist church. <clears throat> Now, a difference between Israel's God and the God of other nations was that Israel's God is holy. <clears throat> Leviticus 11, 44 and 45 says, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. For I am the Lord that bringeth you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So he says, Sanctify yourselves. But from what I learned from studying, in this particular reference, when it says sanctify yourselves, <clears throat> he's talking about doing the things, the purification, the feast, all of those things that Israel was supposed to do, and that was how you sanctified yourself. Now, <clears throat> if you go to 3 Nephi 12.33, it has a different meaning for the word sanctify. He said, now this is the commandment, repent all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Now I think that's the sanctify that we're supposed to be following. And, uh, you know, we receive the Holy Ghost, uh, and then we're supposed to stand spotless before God at the last day. Uh, I'm going to bring up a little <clears throat> sidelight again. Uh, this is something F. Henry Edwards mentioned in his book, uh, The Power That Worketh In Us. And he says, we have an invocation, and we pray, Lord, send thy spirit to be with us. But his point is, well, weren't we confirmed to have his spirit always with us? So why do we pray to ask his spirit to come? What he suggests is that we pray that we might be in a condition to receive that spirit because, anyway, you get it. It's probably a minor thing. but <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to go to 43 and 6. And this is uh, the many ways that God tries to reach out to us. And uh, I'm going to read you this verse 6. <clears throat> and again, the Lord shall utter his voice out of heaven, saying, Hearken, O ye nations of the earth, and hear the words of the God that made you. O ye nations of the earth, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. Okay. How oft have I called you by the mouth of my servants, and by the ministering of angels, and by mine own voice, and by the voice of thunderings, and by the voice of lightnings, and by the voice of tempests, and by the voice of earthquakes, and great hailstorms, and by the voice of famines and pestilences of every kind, and by the great sound of a trump, and by the voice of judgment, and by the voice of mercy all the day long, and by the voice of glory and honor and the riches of eternal life, and would have saved you with an everlasting salvation, but ye would not. So, you know, the Lord is trying to reach out to us. So now, Let's think about where we are today in the world. Um, you know, they just had this bomb cyclone hit the Northwest in California and Nevada, and they had like all-time record rains there uh, just recently. Uh, this summer, we saw all-time record highs. They had like a record high for the country of Canada last summer, 112 or something like that. The highest it's ever been in Canada. Um, you know, the, the Northeast had an 87 mile an hour wind gust, and they had waves with the Northeaster. The waves were crashing over the, the sea walls. Um, you know, we have been told in, I think it was section 156, 
that climate change is upon you and natural disasters will become more frequent. So we see these things happening, but is the world repenting? Not so much. We have COVID. Um, uh, Four million people have died. In the Spanish flu, there were 18 million died in 1917 and 18 and maybe a little beyond, I'm not sure. I read that uh, so far the rate of death has been higher with COVID than it was the Spanish flu. Uh, in the United States, 700,000 people have died, and uh, I forget how many people have been, have been ill. So are we repenting? Doesn't seem like it, does it? Uh, we, how many of the revelations through Fred Larson were we told to be alert to the signs of the times, political unrest, uh, you know, moral decay, so forth? Um, has the world repented? Not so much. So... Um, also on this thing about climate change, you know, section 108 says that uh, the people of the North countries will smite the ice and it will flow down before them and a highway will be cast up in the midst of the great deep and they will come and bring forth their treasure to the children of Ephraim. Well, um, I have heard, um, first of all, since 1990 to 2020, so 30 year period, uh, Greenhouse gases have increased by 47% in the world. Um, but here's the thing. Yes, the Earth is warmed by, what do they say, 1.2 degrees C. However, in the Arctic, it has warmed up 5.5 degrees. Things are starting to grow that used to be tundra. Um, so the North is warming up a lot more than the rest of the the world, and so it sure sounds like fulfillment of section 108. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, some people said that 9-11 was a judgment on the country. Well, the critics of that theory said, wait a minute, there were a lot of innocent people that died in those towers. How can you say it was a judgment on the country? Well, I think it's F. Henry Edwards who said that <clears throat> A lot of times, the innocent suffer right along with the guilty. So yes, it could have been a judgment on the country, and yes, innocent people did die, but it was, they were collateral damage. Yes, I think more often than not, uh, the more righteous are saved, but not universally. Um, there's some, just like we were talking earlier about training up a child in the way he should go. Yes, there is that influence to do that, but it isn't 100%. That's kind of how I look at it. So Abraham Lincoln, in his uh, second inaugural address, said that slavery, well, no, the Civil War was a judgment on the nation for the sin of slavery. And of course, that was a terrible war, a huge number of casualties and so forth. So... Um, we see that there are judgments being poured out, but it doesn't seem like we're getting the message. F. Henry Edwards has written, Prayer is the upreach of the soul toward God. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Now there are three goals in prayer. The first one is to align your desires to God align your will to God, and align your life to God. Now, uh, are there things that we need to do? If we want God to answer our prayer, are there things that we need to do? I'll just throw that open for a little bit of discussion here. What do we need? If, you know, I mean, I'm not saying God doesn't answer our prayers, but is he more likely to answer them the, the, if, if there are certain conditions in our life? Terry? Yes, and that's right after the one about administration, call for the elders. Yeah. So if we want God to hear our prayers, then we need to try to get our lives in order. All right. <clears throat> I think I'll skip down a little bit. Now, when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he had... Uh, Peter, James, and John, 
go with him, to watch with him, right? But the way I look at it, that watching was kind of like he needed some company because this was his darkest hour. Now, that might have been even worse than the actual being hanging from the cross because he sweat drops of blood. Uh, that can't, can't be much worse than that. <clears throat> so I think that's one definition of watching in that case. But if you go to Luke 12, you'll read this. Let your loins be girded about and have your lights burning. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. For he shall gird himself and make them sit down and will come forth and serve them. So in this case, what does it mean to watch? I'm starting to see glazed eyes. <laughs> ben? Be obedient? Okay. Okay, that's good. To be prepared, okay. How do we, get, how do we prepare? Okay, okay. Those are good answers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ralph? Good. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about Luke chapter 12 just a little bit. I'm starting, uh, well, it talks, it uses this watching. Well, I guess I already read from it, but uh, <clears throat> it starts, uh, I'm going to start in verse 17. It says, Beware of covetousness. It says, Man's life consisteth not in the things that he possesseth. And then uh, he tells a parable about the rich man who wanted to build bigger barns so that he could retire and eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, but as the parable goes, he died that night, and the Lord said, now whose things, whose will these things be? And, and he was chastising the man. In other words, the man was rich in worldly possessions, but poor toward God. That's the way I read it. And there's almost a little bit of an element of being chastised for doing nothing. The man wanted to take his ease. And so I think maybe that the Lord is condemning him a little bit for that. And so, you know, we hear, don't be a couch potato. Being a couch potato is bad. Uh, Kay got me this watch last Christmas, and it tells me to stand every hour, you know. Uh, and it wants me to get 30 minutes of exercise and so forth. <clears throat> so being... Inactive is bad, which is kind of going to what you're saying. Um, now, there's another part of, of watching that I think of is uh, if you go back to February of 1984, an editorial came out in the Saints Herald that, that year, that month, and it was talking about disjunctive revelation. Well, everyone that was plugged in knew immediately what that meant. That meant that they were going to ordain women come conference two months later. And sure enough, it happened. But I was talking to, I remember this, I was talking to a high priest in the church after that <clears throat> editorial came out. 
and he didn't have a clue what that was talking about. And so I told him. And sure enough, you know, it, it proved to be true. So, you know, w the way we're supposed to evaluate these things is Isaiah 8 and 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You know, the, the inventors, the great inventors that we've had, um, they didn't just come out of the blue. They were immersed in what they were doing. And because they were so immersed, they had these breakthrough insights. Well, that's the way we have to be. We have to be so immersed in things that we are able to discern the signs of the times and, and what is happening in the church and in the world around us. We have to be able to evaluate things according to the scriptures. So Jesus goes on and it says, So shall it be with him that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Again, this is about the rich man. So, <clears throat> and at this point he's talking to his apostles. Then in verse 38 he says, Let your loins be girded about and have your lights burning. Well, that means be dressed ready for service. In other words, you are ready to go. You are ready to uh, be of service. And then it says, have your lights burning. Well, we should be shining examples to the world. Uh, then in verse 39, it says, that ye yourselves may be like unto men who wait for their Lord, that when he knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. In other words, they are ready for his return, and they are fully engaged. Now, here is a, a real interesting tidbit. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read you the King James Version first, and then I'm going to read you the Inspired Version. This is from verse 41, and the King James reads, And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. So in other words, this was talking about the nighttime. There's three watches in the Jewish nighttime. So he's saying you could come in the second or third watch. Now there's the, the inspired version. For behold, he cometh in the first watch of the night, and he shall also come in the second watch, and again he shall come in the third watch. And verily I say unto you, he hath already come as, is, as it is written of him. And again, when he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch, blessed are those servants when he cometh that he shall find so doing. So this says there's two more comings of the Lord. Now, I'd like to tell you an experience that I heard from the lips of Vivian Sorensen. Vivian Sorensen was a 70 appointee in the church, our heritage church, working in Australia, which is where he was from. He had a trailer, and he would drive around with his trailer and camp, and from there he would go and minister to the saints and do his missionary work. So one day he came back from his ministry, and he came into his trailer, and laying on the table was the book by... Uh, <clears throat> Oh, my goodness. Help me out here. What's the name of the author? Uh, the Three Visitations and Coming of Christ, Adolf Lundin. Thank you. Adolf Lundin. And it's laying on his table. And Adolf Lundin goes into great detail about the three visitations and the final coming in glory. So uh, Vivian went around, and he asked everybody in the area, anybody he could think of, did you put this book on my table? And they all said no. Well, then he went to Arthur Oakman, and he said, what do you think of this book? And Arthur Oakman said, God help the church if this book is not true. Very interesting. I guess Arthur Oakman saw what was coming. <clears throat> so, uh, I'll be wrapping up here in a minute. So in verse 54 then, we find that the evil servant is he who is not found watching. And if that servant is not found watching, he will say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men's servants and the maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken. Now, I don't know what's so bad about eating. <laughs> I like to do that. Uh, I can understand the part about being drunk. I remember my grandmother coming to visit us, and she got off the airplane, and the man sitting in front of her was an apostle in our heritage church. And her comment was, he ordered several drinks on the plane as we were traveling from Detroit to Kansas City. So, I don't know. Anyway, um, 
And here's <clears throat> one more tidbit, and I'll leave you with this one. So Arthur Oakman is talking about the gospel, the restoration gospel versus the Protestant world, and he points out that the Protestant world looks at Jesus in the past. They look at his earthly ministry and what he did. They look in minute detail. But as for what the Lord would do in the days to come, they give it no thought. They have no idea. And it's only in this church, uh, in the restoration, that we look to the future. What is the Lord going to do in the future? Um, so a very interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, the cause of Zion evidences an extension of what we find in the New Testament. In other words, uh, our Protestant friends, they know their New Testament maybe better than us, which isn't a good thing, but perhaps they do. But on the other hand, we are looking to Zion. We're looking for the things to come when the Lord will return and we can be with him again. So that, to, to me, is a great advantage to be part of this work. And that's it for today. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>